Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. <laughs> Sometimes an old prospector, too. <laughs> Who was that masked man? <laughs> she coming with my wife? The <laughs> <laughs> uh, Road Ranger was not some kind of broadcast from California or anything. It was broad it originated, broadcast, and performed in good old Detroit, Michigan, at the Maccabees Building, which is right on Woodward Avenue. You're standing on the steps of the Detroit Institute of Arts. You look across the street, look to the left. There's the Maccabees building. It still has a radio on tower on top. Only well, now it might say Wayne State University up there. <laughs> but uh, that's where it was broadcast from. Right in downtown Detroit. My speech is uh, divided into five parts. And, uh, history of the Lone Ranger. What happened to the Lone, some of the WXYZ staff. A, tip to the a trip to the Maccabees building, a jam handy movie, and a question and answer session. Uh, the, the origin of the Lone Ranger didn't happen until later in the show. It didn't happen right at the very beginning, but it took them a while to develop it. But I'll tell you this ahead of time because it's important to know why the Lone Ranger did what he did. There were six Texas Rangers following um, Butch Cavendish, trailing him, and they were um, they were, went into Bryant's Gap, which was a canyon, and they, they were ambushed by Butch Cavendish and his gang. And they were all up in the hills surrounding him, and there were six rangers, and they shot them all, and they thought, they could see that there was no movement, and they thought they were all dead. So these six rangers, and uh, Butch Cavendish and his gang leave convinced that they killed the, everyone. So uh, these, these men are laying there, and five of them actually were dead. But Tato happened to be riding along and find, found these dead uh, men. Like, and he found that one man was still alive, and so he nursed him back to health. And meanwhile, <coughs> Tato dug six graves for five people and made the other grave look like the other person was buried there. So when finally when the Lone Ranger came to, he, they said, he said to the Tato, um, what happened to the others? And Tano said, others all dead. You, Lone Ranger. <laughs> so Tano, Tano, Tano gave his name, gave actually the Lone Ranger his name. Uh, the scripts were mostly written by Fran Stryker, who was a freelance writer from Buffalo. And uh, Mr. Trent, here's a picture of George W. Trendle who was, he was the uh, main, he was the boss of WXYZ. Him and his silent partner, John Krinsky, owned a series of movie theaters. And they, saw, they, they sold them and bought WGPH, which was stood for uh, George Harrison Phelps, W and George Harrison Phelps. And they had call letters changed to WXYZ. They had to get permission from the government to have that done. They picked WXYZ because they wanted the title to be the last word in broadcasting. <laughs> uh, George Tremble was the man in charge, and they became a, they let they were with CBS when they first took over the station, and they be, they decided to become an independent station. But this is during the Depression. Now this is like 1930 and 32, and they were losing four four thousand dollars a week. And so they needed to create new programming. So they, one of the first shows they did, which was an adventure show, was uh, called Warner Lester Manhunter. That was debuted in 1932. And then Mr. Trendle said that when he used to own radio stations, uh, one of the most popular movies, when he used to own t movie houses, uh, one of the most popular movies were, were Western. So he's, he wanted his staff to come up with a, a new radio show, which was a, a Western. 
So he called his staff together and said, we'll meet back in a week. I want you to all come back with some good ideas of a Western character. And we'll get back in one week. So the staff went, and a week later they returned, and everyone had great ideas. Franz Schreker uh, re said that we should have a Lone Ranger Safety Club. Someone suggested, let's have a William Tell Overture, which uh, the reason they picked it was it was, uh, it, it was free. It was eminent domain or something. They could have it for free, and they didn't pay for it. So they picked William Tell Overture. Someone thought, let's have a mask on the man. That's a great idea. Let's, someone said, let's have silver bullets. How about he rides a great white horse? So everyone had these great ideas, and everyone left the meeting thinking that they were the originator of the Lone Ranger. <laughs> uh, the show became a runaway success, and the staff uh, were surprised later on when they got a letter from Mr. Trundle, which was marked Assignment of Authorship. For $10 in future considerations, the paper stated that George Trendle was the sole creator of the Lone Ranger, when really he, all he did was plant the seeds. But if they wanted to keep their jobs, that was the future consideration. <laughs> <laughs> so when they signed the paper, George Trendle became the sole creator of the Lone Ranger. <coughs> About this time, they hired a man named Brace Beaver. And we'll talk more about him later on. The first Lone Ranger show was in 1933 in January, and several actors played the Lone Ranger, but the first popular Lone Ranger, the one who lasted the longest, was Earl Grazer, and he took over the, the, the Lone Ranger as the Lone Ranger in, in May of 1933. He was only 24 years old when he started the show. He was a Wayne State University student. And uh, so after a few shows, though, they just had the Lone Ranger, and Mr. Trendle said he talks too much. There's not enough action. <laughs> and the narrator said, and Jim Jewell said that we need somebody to explain the, to the audience what's going on in the Ranger's mind. He can't keep on talking to his horse. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, they have another staff meeting. How are we gonna, what are we going to do? Who's going to be, we need a sidekick. Should it be a woman? Mr. Trendle said, no way, no way. We're, there was no romance. There's not going to be any romance on this show. And someone suggested an Indian. And Mr. Trendle thought about it. He says, yes, that would be good. Just make sure he's not like the main focus of the show. So they got a man named John Todd to be Tondo. Tondo was 57 years old when he began the role in 1933. This is a picture of John Todd without his title <laughs> up. Uh, the Lone Ranger and Tonto called each other Kimo Sabi. And where did they get that name? Well, Jim Jewell again remembered a camp in Mullet Lake, Michigan called Camp Kimo Sabi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's where they got Kimo Sabi. <laughs> this is an early cast picture. And, here we go. There's Brace Beamer. This is actually the Lone Ranger here, Earl Grouser. But, Earl was only five foot six. Uh, Brace was about six foot two. He's a big, big man. Looked like the Lone Ranger in Mr. Kendall's mind. So, he, in publicity shots, Brace Beamer was the Lone Ranger, so but even though he was the Lone Ranger, Brace Beamer in this picture was the, was the Lone Ranger. Uh, here's a picture, another picture of Brace Beamer dressed as the Lone Ranger. The first public appearance of the Lone Ranger took place in 1933. They weren't quite sure if they had a hit on their hands. So they arranged to have, at the Children's Circus at the casino on Belle Isle, they had a Detroit Parks and Recreation event. And, it, and the intermission act was, the Lone Ranger was going to appear. So they rented a horse from Rooney Circus, 
And Brace rode out in a red, in a red, in a red horse, and all these kids saw the Lone Ranger ride out, and they went crazy. And they started rushing toward the Lone Ranger, Brace Peter. Brace was afraid that someone was going to get hurt. So he told the kids, back! So go back, scouts! Go back! And they all listened, they all stopped, they went back, and they followed the Lone Ranger's uh, orders, and everyone was safe. And they, with the 10,000 kids rushing like that, they knew they had a hit on their hands. Here's an early picture of a premium picture of the Lone Ranger. Notice <coughs> that they haven't even given him a mask yet. It's, they have like a bandana mm -hmm. yeah. right there. It's not a mask yet. That's how early this was. Uh, you would think that, don't you, I mean, you would just think that the Lone Ranger and Todd would both have horses. In the early episodes. <laughs> I don't know why they didn't think of it. And sometimes they had Tyler running next uh, side by the next time the ranger. Um, but they rode together and really finally they did give Tano a horse. And his name was called the first horse was called Whitefeather. In the later episodes he was called Scout. This is an early shot in the main studio at WXYZ. And notice that the man with the chair is slapping a stick on a pole. That was gunshots. Uh, in 1936, the Lone Ranger was such a success that they, Mr. Trento again, got his staff together, and they, this is a modern day, 1936, modern day uh, crime fighters. So they came up with an idea of the Green Hornet. And Al Hodge was the Green Hornet. And in the storyline, um, Dan Reed was in, in the Lone Ranger. Dan Reed was the Lone Ranger's nephew. When Dan Reed grew up to be a man, he had a son. And his son was Britt Reed, who turned out to be the Green Hornet. And when the Green Hornet went to television, the actor changed. Uh, I'm sorry, when, when Al Hodge went to television, he was Captain Video. There's a picture of Al Hodge as Captain Video and a picture of him as Green Hornet. In uh, 1938, they had a movie, a, a serial, by Republic, starring Lee Powell as the Lone Ranger. Unfortunately, Lee Powell died in 1944 when he was serving in the military. I heard that in the, he was in the Pacific and he drank poison sake. Oh. And it killed him. And in 1939, they released a, another movie, Lone Ranger Rides Again, with Robert Livingston. Uh, the Lone Ranger had a few actors who went on to more fame. One of them was Myron Wallace. Anybody know who Myron Wallace is? A U of M graduate? Something. There he is. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Mike Wallace. Yeah, he, was, he used to be on uh, work at WXYZ. <laughs> Huh. Another actor, another actor who worked at WXYZ was Amos Jacobs. Danny Thomas. There you go. Danny Thomas. <laughs> Danny Thomas used to work at WXYZ. Here's a picture of Kern's department store in downtown Detroit, 1938. The store window around Christmas time. They had a Lone Ranger village where they would get boys dressed as the Lone Ranger, teenagers, to take you up the elevator to the fifth floor toy store, and you could go to the Lone Ranger village, and you could get your picture taken, and you could buy toys. <laughs> and one of those elevator boys was Fred Foy, who we'll mention later on. And some of the things you could buy at this shop were the Lone Ranger surprise package. You could buy a Lone Ranger Tim Windup. Or you could get Lone Ranger Bubblegum. In 1938, uh, the Green Hornet was going well, Lone Ranger's going well. Mr. Trendle had another, let's have another show. How about Mr. Trendle wanted the dog as the star of this next show? 
So they came up with a show called Challenge of the Yukon, starring Jay Michael. Later on, when this show went to television, it starred Richard Simmons, which is not the exercise game. <laughs> A different Richard Simmons. Everything was running smoothly at WXYZ until the unthinkable happened on Monday, April 7th, 1941. The show was broadcast on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Earl Grazer, who was the Lone Ranger, was driving home to Farmington down Grand River after the late broadcast. This is actually Tuesday morning now. It was a Monday broadcast. It's Tuesday morning now at 1 o'clock in the morning. He fell asleep behind the wheel and hit the back of the car and was killed instantly. This is Tuesday. The Lone Ranger show goes on the air the next day. Mr. Trendle issued a press release that says he was sorry that it happened, but the Lone Ranger goes on. And they'll have a new Lone Ranger tomorrow. Mr. Trendle held another staff meeting, and they were trying to decide who was going to be the new Lone Ranger when Chuck Livingston, who was the director, suggested Grace Beamer. And uh, they, still Mr. Trendle wasn't convinced, but um, someone brought up, he does do all your public appearances, Mr. Trendle. And Mr. Trendle said, well, we'll have to break him in easy. So they had Fran Stryker rewrite the scripts that the Lone Ranger was severely injured and he could barely talk. <laughs> Mr. Trendle did not want the shock of a new voice. Think about it. They just read the Lone Ranger on Monday, now it's Wednesday. A new voice, so the Lone Ranger would... He did talk, but it's like... <laughs> so, actually it was about a whole week before, the, before Grace Beamer actually spoke as the Lone Ranger. And they rewrote all the scripts, and Tato became like the, the focus of the episodes. And uh, so the Grace Beamer took over as the Lone Ranger in 1941. He ended up playing the Lone Ranger longer than anyone. Uh, the first, this is what I collect, these toys. So this is one of the toys. The first premium they offered after Grace Beamer took off, off over the Lone Ranger was called a warning siren. And Tato used this to signal the Lone Ranger when there was enemies approaching. <laughs> About this time, in 19, well, 1944, they moved to the Mendelssohn Mansion out of the, out of the McAdee's building. They needed more space. Shirley Russell, who was, uh, she was on the show. They, they actually fired her at this time because she was a little girl on the show, and uh, her voice changed. And she could not be the little girl anymore, so they fired her. Uh, Fred Foy took over as the announcer in 1948. And about this time, the Lone Ranger issued a crazy toy. This is called an atom bomb ring. <laughs> the Lone Ranger issued an atom bomb ring. You can't see the association here. You take off the little red plastic part of the back, and you look inside, and you see like atoms being smashed in there. <laughs> Uh, a very unusual toy. <laughs> In 1949, they decided to have a Lone Range television show. So Mr. Trendle did not want to use Grace Beamer as the television Lone Ranger. And the reason was, he had a sure thing on radio with the Lone Ranger. Television was experimental. He didn't trust it. So he had... <laughs> He interviewed Clayton Moore, and Clayton, in the interview, Mr. Trendle asked Clayton, Clayton, would you like to be the Lone Ranger? And Clayton looked Mr. Trendle in the eye and said, Mr. Trendle, I am the Lone Ranger. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Trendle obviously gave him the job. They hired Jay Silverhill as Tato. And this, so at this time, you had television... The Lone Ranger started on television in 1949, but it didn't end on radio until 54. So you had a time where you had the Lone Ranger on television and on radio at the same time. Whenever they made public appearances during this short period of time, 
Grace Beamer still made the public appearance, but they had the television Tonto appear with him. Face over here. <laughs> Here's a picture of in the Mandelson Mansion. Does that look familiar, Chuck? Um, this is yeah. an anniversary picture of the Lone Ranger cast. Uh, the Lone Ranger was on television for two seasons, where Mr. Trendle got the idea that I think I think must have been that. Uh, maybe Clayton Moore wanted a raise, so they so let's just get a new Lone Ranger. So they hired a man named John Hart to be the Lone Ranger. Oh. And Mr. Trendle thought by putting a, a larger mask on him <laughs> that the children wouldn't recognize that they had a new Lone Ranger. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it didn't work. Yeah. And, but they were committed for all seasons, so they did the episodes. And so John Hart was the Lone Ranger for one season. And here's the reasoning, here's a letter reasoning why they switched Lone Rangers. It actually said, um, uh, I thought Clayton Moore looked much too old in the park, that John Hart was a handsome young man who could do a far better job, and uh, that was his reasoning. Now, Clayton Moore was 35, and John Hart was 30 at the time, and they thought that 35 was too old. Well, it didn't work, and the kids, did, they, they clamored for... Clayton Moore, and so for the fourth season, good old Clayton Moore was back as the Lone Ranger. The last live radio show was September 3rd, 1954. They had a Lone Ranger movie starring Clayton Moore in 1956. The last TV show ended June 6th, 1957, and after the, the last TV show, they actually came out with a, another movie starring the cast, The Lone Ranger in the City of Gold in 1958. That's the end of part one of my speech. Uh, part two is what happened to some of the major personalities. Unfortunately, it's bad news. <laughs> Earl Grazer. The thing that's important, though, a lot of these people are buried right in this area. I mean, anyone here could probably go visit these graves, for most of them. He's buried at Grand Lawn Cemetery, Grand River, near Telegraph. Fran Stryker, unfortunately, was killed in 1962 in a head-on collision. He's buried in Arcade Rural Cemetery in Wyoming County, New York. I'm familiar with this guy, Brace Beamer. He's over at Whitechapel over by my house. I actually took this picture. He's buried with his second wife, Lita. And I go over there about twice a year and clean up his grave clean up the uh, weeds that are going around. There's no indication on his grave that he's the Lone Ranger. The only thing, the closest thing that would indicate anything is that horse right there. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. I'm assuming that's supposed to be silver. Mr. Trendle is at the Woodlawn Cemetery, 8 Mile Woodward. We've all passed it hundreds of times. <clears throat> Jay Silverheels is buried in Woodland Hills Cemetery. He died in 1980 in Los Angeles. Clayton Moore died in 1999. He's at Forest Lawn in Los Angeles. John Hart died in 2009. He's, he was cremated. Fred Foy died in 2010. He's buried in Massachusetts. That's the end of part two. <laughs> <laughs> part three is really fake. I believe in faith. Yeah. My, friend, my friend and I, Gene Smith, were big radio historians, so we wanted to go visit the Maccabees building. We had no idea where the studios were at. So we go down to the Maccabees building one day after attending his art openings and going to the Coney's down in Detroit. And so we spent the whole day down there, and so finally our last stop was the Maccabees building. We took the elevator to the 14th floor and walked around didn't see anything that looked like a radio station. Took the third, went down to the 13th floor, walked all around. We did this all the way down to the second floor. <laughs> this is where fate comes in. <laughs> this is the math we're building. This is where fate comes in. We pushed the button for floor, floor number two, uh, at floor number two, for the, for the first floor. The elevator stops. We get on. There's a man on the elevator. And, the elevator's door closed and the elevator starts heading down to floor number one. And he says, um, hey, how are you guys doing? He said, not too good. And he goes, well, why? 
I know this story sounds hard to believe, but it's true. <laughs> why? He says, why? And I said, I said, we came to visit the WXYZ studios. We couldn't find them. And the man says, well, they're on the 15th floor. <laughs> and we said, well, you can't get up there. He says, yeah, I know. It's locked, but I'm the building supervisor. I can take you up there. <laughs> so believe it or not, we ended up, no one can just walk up there. They are locked. But the just they actually, the, the building supervisor's office is up there, so he goes up there all the time. It's really not much up there. It's really pretty empty. This is, uh, this is the, from the 14th floor, you have to walk up these steps to get to the 15th floor. All of the actors mostly went up the front way. So all the famous people went up the stairway. And then after you got up to that floor, they had these doors, double doors on a lot of them because they had to keep out all the noise. And here's the studio picture from 1930s. Notice there's a window in the back right there. Right there. This is what the studio looks like today. There's the same window right there. If you look out that window, you see the Renaissance Center. So, What's in that studio today? Hmm? What's in that studio? Nothing. It's mostly empty. You'll see it's other pictures. It's, there's a few things. I'll, I'm going to get to the best part later. Uh, so there's the window right there. Same window. And that's what it looks like today. That's, the only, that's really the only thing up there. Um, this is sound effects in the 1930s. That's what it looked like back then. This is what it looks like today. Uh, some uh, uh, underground radio station took over after WXYZ left. So they did change things around. They put in shag carpeting for, for some of the sound deadening. But here's this is kind of off of the sound effects. This is what this is the director's booth. This is where Chuck Livingston. There's that window. There's another window in the background that again you're looking south. You, you can see the Renaissance Center from there. This is the sound effects outside the sound effects studio, behind the sound effects where you walk up. The director's booth is, let's see, that's the director's booth there. You walk up these steps and there's the sound effects. He had to give cues to the sound effects. Another picture, again, there's another window facing the south. Out of all the things that, uh, this is what I really want. I found this little toilet up there, and I'm a collector, and I, if there was one thing I could have, there's not much up there, but this is right off the main studio. Do you know how many times the Lone Ranger, Green Hornet, and so on, <laughs> use that toilet? I want that toilet. <laughs> Make me a plea to Main State, give me that toilet. <laughs> See, now that was the end of part three. Now we're going to have a short little movie, uh, a jam handy movie. We can do this. This is a movie about. <laughs> Somebody tell me something. Wait a minute. I know I don't want to talk that. This is a movie about sound effects. And this has a lot of the WXYZ cast in it. I'm going to show you Tato. Uh, the Lone Ranger's not in this, but Tato is, and there's, you'll see a few. <coughs> Should it say, it say who directed it? No, it's a jam, and it doesn't say. Chuck Livingston left the shows and went to Jeb Handy to direct uh, movies. So. Well, he likely did it then. That's but what, anyway, this that's is what a, I'm guessing, yeah. Uh, this is a movie about sound effects. And remember, it has a lot, this is, it's not in the WXYZ studios, uh, but I, 
there's a lot of WXYZ actors in this. In fact, they all are WXYZ actors, but no more arrangers. But Tano's in here, and when he appears, I'm going to point him out to you. Okay. 
days in a row this country too long. We're going to clean them up today. But we've got to remember that old Pete Bell is with them. We don't want them to get hurt. All right, boys. Let's clean up. <laughs> <laughs> There's Tano. Tano is right there. No hair. He says one thing. Hold up there. We said fire to the gap and stop. Oh, 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 oh. Next week, you have a couple of inches from the breeze, right? And this is where the fire they can't get through. It's a pretty good fire, Sam. Where is the dry skin here? Better get it started. Cody, we get some of that dead wood ready in a hurry.
and down on the first floor, the larger, it was about the size of this room here. Off at, on 15, actually, the, the room was not quite this big, but it, it was a good size room up there. And uh, but that was the, uh, the TV studio. Soupy did the, the 11 o'clock, remember Soupy's on show at night? Yes. That's where I got the pies in the face uh, at that time. By, by the way, uh, at that time, I was the spokesperson for National Bank of Detroit. I did all their commercials uh, and, uh, and on the news. They sponsored the news. Back in those days, it was 15 minutes, 6.15 to 6.30, followed the national news. And I can't remember who the newsman was, but he left the station. His name slips me. He can't be as old as I am. He's just happy to remember anything. You know? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm 85 right now. But anyway, uh, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, anyway, he uh, went to uh, Blue Cross, I think, uh, yeah, as uh, a PR guy and left the station. But anyway, uh, we did the news, everything, no tape, no tape uh, on anything in those days. And so I had to do the, the commercials. I did the opening and closing of the news, and I had to do the commercials live every day at 6.15. And I didn't have time to memorize anything, and uh, so we had cue cards about this wide, about that long, <laughs> and we had a kid that would, uh, I would write up the cue cards, or maybe somebody else would, and uh, he would, uh, as the cameras had four lenses on them, one, two, three, four, and the guy at the back of the camera had could switch from one to the other, not when the camera was on the air, but when it, another camera was on the air, he could change from... There, there was no zoom lenses in those no. days. No. So you had a wide angle, you had a middle angle, and maybe there were only three of them on there, I don't know. It seems to me I remember four, though. Mm. And so, uh, this one particular time, they decided, to, well, let's, let's have a little fun, Chuck. Uh, let's, uh, they cleared it with National Bank of Detroit. The, uh, Soupy was, it, it, this was up on 15D, you know, we had Shout and Shorty Hogan the band up, in the band up there and all the rest of the stuff. And uh, he said, now we're going to break for a commercial and we'll go to you and you do this National Bank of Detroit commercial just like you would if, if the news was on the air, you know. And so they, we wrote up a commercial or else we used one that was already used, I don't remember. But he said, I have never gotten a pie in the face before that time. So he said, Chuck, whatever you do now, don't, don't, don't telegraph it. Don't uh, deliver the last line of the commercial and then go like that, you know? And I said, don't worry, Sufi, don't worry. I have. Well, first of all, let me explain to you, these pies were about 10 inches uh, on a paper plate, you know, the, uh, the kind you get for picnics and things like that. And the studio lights, this is still, you know, black and white television, but we still had heavy, heavy studio lights. Matter of fact, we couldn't wear white shirts in those days, remember? It would bloom on television, and so we had to wear blue shirts, and things like that. So, but anyway, the hot lights would melt the whipped cream if they used whipped cream in there. So they couldn't do that. And he didn't, I, I didn't know this at the time. But they put shaving cream in there, <laughs> thick. And so as the camera dollied in toward me, he had the wide angle lens on there. And so that it, it, they, had to, they had to dolly and dolly in and dolly as I was doing the commercial. And so I'm, I'm reading this, the, the, uh, the thing, you know, and so forth and so on. And so by the time they, uh, they get to, into me, I mean, heavens, I think the camera's only about this far away. And the cue card was there. Soupy's on this side of the camera with his pie, you know? And so he delivers it, and I took it eyes wide open. Well, I didn't work for the next two days. <laughs> I, <laughs> my eyes were, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was fun. Though. Chuck, you're still acting, right? Well, uh, you're still acting, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm uh, involved in a, in a theater you probably never, ever heard of. Uh, Avon down the road here. And we've got a show coming up. We're rehearsing. In fact, I'm supposed to be in rehearsal right now over there. And uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a wonderful life. You know the show? Jimmy Stewart, you know, and, uh, and, and Lionel, and so forth. Well, I'm playing 
thought it, I don't pretend to be Lionel Barrymore, but I mean, I, I do the, I'm the bad guy, yeah. Potter. Oh. Oh. Well, Peter Bailey, you know. <laughs> Any, anyway. Do we have any questions for any, anyone here? Okay. How did Tonto get his name? Say that again? How did Tonto get his name? Did Tonto get his name? It's like anything else, they just decided on it. I heard that people think that there could be some kind of deeper meaning to it, why they picked it, like it means a dumb person or something, but I personally haven't really found that, that they didn't pick it because they're, I guess they just like the sound of it. Who was White Fang? Uh, well, that was um, Clyde Adler. He was the floor, floor director on the show. And uh, so he was the one who gave Soupy the cues. By the way, that show was never scripted. <laughs> never, ever, ever, ever. And, uh, we're talking about the kids' show. Uh, yeah. And. Uh, uh, it, tried, uh, it, it just sort of developed. He put a, he had a thing on one sleeve and a thing on the other sleeve, and he wound up somebody else had to do the floor direction. And all Clyde did was white fang and black tooth and uh, and the guy at the door and so forth. I did appear in the window one time with Pookie, the little uh, puppet hand puppets, uh, but that was years later. So, <laughs> any, else, any other I questions? Go forward to lunch. Show. Okay. Is it true that one time Soupy opened the door and the woman was new? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah well, it is true. I have a tape of that at home. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there then. Yeah. Who's got another question? How about way in the back? Could you tell me what happened between the two James Jewell. She wants to know what happened to James Jewell. Okay, answer the question. Well, he did move to Chicago. And uh, he, he, he moved to Chicago. Oh, wait a minute here. Well, he turned to Los Angeles. Do you want to say? Well, um, he, he, he went up to. Get First of all, say, her, say how you're related to Jim Drill. He's my great uncle. And he's my uncle. Well, no, you don't, don't, don't fool don't with him. Just hold it up to your mouth. Okay. Yeah. There. Um, so so they, he went out to Los Angeles. His, his brother was um, his lawyer financing him. And. Um, he, want, he had a whole stack of radio dramas he wanted to uh, work out in Los Angeles. Um, and he did a few things out there, and, um, but it didn't pan out like he wanted to. He came back to Chicago. Um, and I guess he did some... Did he stay the theater or TV? He did. He, was a, um, he worked in... I don't remember what he did after he got back to Chicago. He also invented things. He was always coming up with ideas for, um, like, toys and, uh, and patenting different ideas and things like that. And he started, at, at the end of his life, he started a company called Talent Scout, I think it was, where uh, they would get tapes of uh, actors' voices, and then he acted as an agent trying to get jobs for these actors in Chicago. Okay, thanks for the James Jewell information. Coming from the relatives of Jewel. Anyone else have a question? How about right over here? Where did the value system used in the Lone Ranger come from? The value system? Yeah, they have a set of values that they always <laughs> portray. They, for instance, that the Lone Ranger is not supposed to kill anybody. <coughs> you know, the reason he didn't, he really, he, the Lone Ranger mostly shot the guns out of the, yeah, the bad guy's hands. Here's, here's the reason that. The Lone Ranger was so reluctant to fire his gun. He used silver bullets. Silver bullets are not, he owned a silver mine, but that was, he, he actually picked silver bullets because he wanted to be very cautious about actually shooting. He wanted each shot to mean something. So that's the reason he picked silver bullets. And uh, he was very economical on the shots. And, and, it's any show I've listened to, if he's killed someone, it's not, I, I don't remember him killing anyone. It's always shooting the gun out. He had to be the best shot in the world to shoot someone's gun out of their hand across the room. No, he never, never injured anybody, really. He's a lot, a lot of fights, though. Uh, fist fights. we right over there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 
That was like his calling card. They knew that if, if the silver bullet was there, this was actually the Lone Ranger. A lot of people questioned who he was on the show because uh, they were just worried. Uh, that anyone could pose. He's a masked man. And so his calling card was the silver bullet. He showed it to, when he, as soon as he showed it to someone, they would know that this is actually the Lone Ranger. <laughs> they gave away premiums. They had premiums of the silver bullet. Sure, they had all that. All that. Anything you can think of, practically, that was related to children, toys. Do you have something like that? Yes. <laughs> um, if you'll notice, you got, did you have another question there, sir? The early broadcast of the regular program, the Lone Ranger Yes. Did they do it more than once a day? Early broadcast of WXYZ where they broadcast more than once a day. Okay. Chuck, you know the uh, Well, I was there. We just did, uh, the, as I said, the uh, Green Hornet had just ended a few months before that. We did the Ranger Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Sergeant Preston, the challenge of the Yukon was Tuesdays and Thursdays. They, they actually broadcast um, a show for the West Coast. They did an East Coast show, so there were they like at least two broadcasts. Yeah. That's why Earl Browser was driving home so late oh, the day he was killed, because he actually did, it was like a 10.30 broadcast. So <laughs> the show ended about 11 o'clock. They probably went out behind the Mackey's building and had a few beers. <laughs> and he was driving home. And that's why he was driving home so late. Well, they did two podcasts live. Yes, uh, they did. A lot of times, if you're going back and listening to old-time radio shows, the same show could have different, there could be a flub in one of them, and sometimes the two shows, even though they're supposed to be identical, are actually a little bit different. I, I will say this about that, though, um, the last few years of the show, we did do two shows a day at the Lone Ranger, back to back. What they did was, while they were recording the show, I mean, while they were broadcasting the show, they were also recording it onto these 16-inch discs. No, wrong. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, we we did the we did the show that on the 16-inch disc we had a, a room off the master control. Uh, the master control is not in here. This is this is uh, the acting studio, the sound studio, and the control room for that studio. The uh, the rest of the building and the master control is over over this way. And they had a separate room of lathes where they recorded 16-inch transcriptions. We did two shows a day on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of the Lone Ranger only. But the first show was a half-hour show, and it was sponsored by... Uh, well, I, I don't think... No, we didn't mention any sponsor on that show. Uh, because I think it was Wonder Bread in some markets, and uh, they had different commercials. What they did was, they, they put it on these discs. They shipped these to all over the world. Yeah. Actually, to English-speaking countries. There is actually a Lone Ranger club in New Zealand <laughs> from back then. Uh, so they would ship these, and that's how someone in New Zealand could listen to the radio show. They, they took two of these to do one show, because there's only 15 minutes of this, and it was a half-hour show. They would have part one and part two on two different tur turntables and play this one, and they'd, then they'd put in the commercial, they'd turn it down, the, the music down, there's like a musical bridge in here, turn it down, the announcer would come on and do his announcing of the local, whatever the local product was. Then they would have the other record, and they'd start turning the volume up on the second one, there's like a long interlude of the music, but that's where the, uh, that's where the announcer was speaking with the commercial, then they turn it up, and they continue, so in New Zealand, you could listen to the Lone Ranger using these yeah. transcription discs. They're then, not always white. This is a rare one. Yeah. Being white, they're usually black. What we had, uh, the scripts were in two different colors. The regular script would be on, say, white paper. But then we would have, in between, we would have certain pages that would be purple. Uh, one day, or yellow, all yellow one day, or pink, or something like that. Now, because the second show, the, say, the, say the first show went from 6 to 6.30. Now that's the one that was recorded on those lathe cutters that they sent to, to be pressed and, and shipped out all over the world to the independent stations or 
the non-network stations. Then the show, the live show, we would pause for 60 seconds, and then the live show would start at 6.30, right on the nose, but that would only be 25 minutes. So that's why all those pages were taken out between the first and the second show. These were pages that apparently didn't make that much difference. Uh, and, uh, and so that uh, you, you, it timed out perfectly then to 24 minutes and 10 seconds or something to leave time for the close and so forth and so on. And uh, so anyway, uh, that's, that's the way the, the Lone Ranger was done when I was there anyway. Uh, uh, for uh, both shows uh, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Tuesdays and Thursdays with Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. Uh, you'll notice on, on the uh, little short film that Larry showed you, uh, one of the guys was talking to somebody in the back up, and he had a cigar box, and he was mm -hmm. talking into a hole in the end of the cigar box. Well, that's the way Yukon King used to bark on, on uh, Sergeant Preston. There was a guy by the name of Ted Johnson, who was one of the actors on, on it was the same actors on all three shows. The, the uh, Green Hornet, the uh, Lone Ranger, Sergeant Preston Yukon, the same actors, with the exception of the leads. Uh, the Sergeant Preston, the, the guy who was playing him when I was there, was Paul Sutton. Uh, Paul lived in, in uh, Royal Oak, decided, uh, toward the end of the show anyway, decided that he wanted to uh, run for Congress, and so, Trendle said, well, you can't do both, you know, you're going to have to quit. So he had, uh, I think, Jay Michael played the part of Sergeant Preston uh, for, uh, from that point on. I did it a couple of times when, uh, well, uh, actually, when Paul was still there, well, to tell you the truth, he, he was, he, uh, well, he was drunk is what he was. Uh, <laughs> He had a liquid lunch, and, uh, and at the time, uh, my voice came the closest to his. At the, so I, well, then, this case is closed. <laughs> On King, hush you musky, a bus you husky. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Who's got a question? Lynn, back over there. The uh, details of the lawsuit, I think, the novel is that uh, the the lawsuit that Clayton Moore was lawsuit? suing. Oh, 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 oh wait, later, in, later in the life. Yeah, yeah right. There's a TV show at all. Do you know about that? Yeah, I'm aware of it. Yeah, well, he... He wanted to keep going, uh, impersonating the Lone Ranger or yeah. playing the role, and... Uh, so, so they, they see, said he couldn't wear the mask. Well, it, George the Trendle mask. had sold the show to somebody else, and it yeah. was the, the other people that owned it then that got in a fight with Clayton Moore. So he wore these huge sunglasses, which yeah. kind of represented his <laughs> And he still appeared. That's how, that's how he made his livelihood in yeah. life, just appearing at, at yes, these sir. events. Yes? Very uh, interesting, Chuck. Uh, as a person who listened to the Lone Ranger in 1938 and on, uh, haven't heard much about Grace Beeman. As a kid listening, to hear that booming voice of Grace yeah. would send me chills up my neck. Did you have any comments on your recollection? Well, Bryce was always like this, you know. <laughs> and uh, I could tell other stories that I won't tell. <laughs> uh, I will say this, Bryce was the epitome of the Lone Ranger. I mean, he, uh, he absorbed it. He, uh, he looked the part. He was tall, 6'4", I believe, something like that. And he strode into the studio every day, up the stairs into his office above the studio here, uh, up there, and uh, you see, Brace had his office up there. He had a secretary, too, and she followed him up the stairs and so forth. And uh, also, the, the writers all had offices up there. The writers, well, of course, uh, Fran Stryker was the head writer. He's the one who actually uh, set the tone uh, that he and Trendle had agreed upon of what the, the do's and don'ts were for the show and all the other writers, and the writers would come and go, you know, throughout the time. Tom Dougal, one of the actors, also used to do some of the writing on the show as well as play the parts. And, Tom Dougal uh, was in the movie. Yeah. He was in this movie. Yeah. He played Mr. X 
Shock Theater. And he was. And well, you told me uh, as we were talking on the phone the other day that uh, 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 Paul Hughes, who uh, played uh, the gravelly guy, he had a gravelly voice. You'd recognize his voice, although I can't do a Paul Hughes, but. He uh, apparently was on Captain Midnight. Yeah, he went to Chicago for a yeah. couple of years. Uh, and Captain Midnight was brought. I had a Captain Midnight decoder ring. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One more thing about Bryce Beamer. He was the youngest volunteer in World War I. He was 14 years old wow. when he joined to join up and he went over to Europe to fight. And uh, they, when he left, he was, four, he was a 14 year old boy. When he came back, he was a 16-year-old man, and he was a real hero. Uh, Shirley Russell, who worked with both Earl Grazer and Grace Beamer, I'll tell you what she said about him. Is, I mean, I'm just telling you the truth. She loved Earl Grazer, and she was really brokenhearted when <coughs> Earl died. And when Grace took over, she said he was full of himself. <laughs> and he was the star. Yeah, yeah. And so that's that's the fact. Yeah. So I, <laughs> he was a, he was a real hero, and he was the he had the I think as, as far as collectors go, Earl Grazer and Brace Beamer, those are the best. Some of the best shows are the ones where Brace Beamer was the narrator. So here you've got. Earl Grazer playing the Lone Ranger, and here's Brace Beamer. It's only done for a year or so where Brace was the narrator, so that you've got the best of both worlds on those particular broadcasts. They're available. You can get WXYZ broadcasts uh, very cheap. Uh, you just go on eBay, look for Lone Ranger, and you can probably get a thousand broadcasts for ten dollars. Mm. You can go back and relive all those wonderful days in history. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. All right, another question. Any other questions? Thank you. Go way in the back. That movie that you showed about the, um, is that available anywhere? I love my grandchildren see that because they, they're, they're, they're sound. Which one? The sound effects movie. It's on your movie. Is that available? I can make copies of it. I brought a couple extra of them. If it's from the Historical Society, I'd be. Uh, glad to donate. Thank you very much. Uh, Just talk to me after. I've got extra money. While, while we've got a couple of minutes left, I'd like to explain this to you. If, you, if, if you've got uh, this, is the uh, the studios that we used in the in the mansion over there, and you can see the acting studio here, the sound studio was here, the control room went all the way across. Actually, the VIP. These were two rows of seats for uh, sponsors or uh, agency people or uh, VIP guests, you know. And there were, the, this is a glass window here, one there. there this was raised, that air back part was raised up. And uh, the, all right, where it says S there, that is uh, the sound man. The sound man up there, uh, you'll find two sound men in the sound studio. You'll find a sound man working, here he is, working right here, only one mic in the acting studio. It would hung down in the center of the room. Now, uh, and the actors and the sound man, well, you can see the sign says microphone there. The LR, easy chair over there, is Brace's chair. Lone Ranger. We had a stool here. The mic hung down from the ceiling, and there was a stool right here that you could put things on or put your knee on or whatever you wanted to do. And the T in this easy chair over here is taco. Mm, what you mean we white man? John Todd, if he was 50, 50 something. 57 when he took over. 57 then. Well, all right, 30 years later, when I got here, if he was in the, if that was in the 30s, uh, no, it was 20 years later, I guess. 50s, he was in his late 70s or something like that. Anyway, John would sit here, and, and uh, 
<laughs> we would be up there at the microphone. Oh, the actors sat on these benches here, and I think there was one here too, but I'm not sure. This bench right now is in my basement. <laughs> it's about six feet long, leather covered, beautiful, you know, holster bench. I tried to borrow from him, but he wouldn't sell. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, John, John would sit there, and, and he was, I mean, he was old. I mean, we were young. I was in my 20s, you know, when I, when I was uh, on the show. And uh, all of them, not, uh, not all of them were, were, but they were much younger than John, anyway. And John would sit there, and he would tend to fall asleep. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know, but sometimes they would be up at the mic or somewhere, and they would see, uh, they'd turn the page, and... and uh, Oh, here's Tonto. So somebody would point, and somebody else would look, and they'd try to get Tonto and get him to get up there to the mic because his. And so Tonto would come up there with his with his uh, script ready, you know, and being the true the true actor that he was, uh, on on radio, dead air is you can't no dead air ever ever right. So Tano's up there at the mic, trying to find his place and wake up. And without letting anything get dead, oh, oh, he must help me. That's what. Uh, 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 really. <laughs> but I mean, he, he, he was there. He, uh, he used to teach radio drama at Wayne. That, that, that he was the, the, uh, the teacher, the, the prof and that. And he taught, taught uh, radio uh, drama and things like that. Uh, also, uh, the, uh, the act, uh, all right, let, let me tell you about the, the sound man. Okay, uh, well first, the hole. What is a hole? Well, it's, it's like, this is a little ante room here with a door here and a door here. Okay, I'm sorry if I'm blocking you people over here on that side. This is what we call the hole. These doors open so the sound people could go back and forth. Uh, the actors didn't go into the sound studio ever. And, and so anyway, what the hole was, if, if uh, you had a scene where the Lone Ranger was supposedly and Tano were riding into a town and there was a celebration or something going on or somebody had just robbed the bank and the whole town was rah, 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 yamane, 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 rutabaga, rutabaga, you know, that kind of thing. Everybody was here in, in, the, in the hole. And then you crack the door a little more and a little more and a little more and let the sound out a little more. You see, the, the microphone can't come to the people. So the people have to come, and the sound has to come to the uh, microphone, okay? So it starts out, you're yelling away in there, and then you crack the door a little bit, a little bit more, that as the sound effects, as the Lone Ranger and Tato are, are getting towards, the, you know, into the town, and then they file out and around to the mic up there. You have to come to the mic, the mic can't come to you. Now, that's the only mic in the acting studio. The, uh, in the sound studio, and the control room, as I said, goes all the way across. We had two sound men, or three, depending on whether, I think that's Dewey Cole up there. Uh, we had uh, Billy Hengstebeck, Billy, uh, Dewey Cole, and I uh, uh, can't think of the third one's name right now. Dewey's father used to be one of the sound men, too, Bud Cole. Oh, maybe, maybe Dewey was the father, Bud was the son. Um, I get to be as old as I am. <laughs> anyway, uh, these mics also, the red dots, are the microphones. Here, 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 all around there. And they hung down from the ceiling, and those lines ran across the ceiling to the control room, to the panel up there in the control room. And uh, so the stairs to go up and down the stairs, and the mic there uh, that they engineer either turns on or doesn't so you have the sound of going up and down stairs wherever you need that and then you also have this car door by the way was for the green hornet and you saw that same car door in that in that film i think and uh and for opening and closing the door now up here 
We have this is on a table up here, and this is on the floor. You have gravel and you have wood in boxes, maybe with an edge about that high, and the box would be about that box would be about that big, you know, two three feet in diameter, and uh, and, and wood on on the top of one. And so, if they're doing a, a horse's hoofs with the, either plungers or coconut shells or whatever. That if, he's, uh, if they're traveling on gravel, it's there. If they go across a, a wooden plank, a bridge, or or any uh, or any store, uh, any wood floors, the horses hoofs are there. And this is for walking in gravel and walking on wood the same way with the mics hanging down. This box right here was for Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. Snow. What do you think was in that box, too? With a mic hanging down, make it sound like they're walking in snow. Any ideas? You ladies should know. Yeah, what is it? Cornstarch. That's it. Even though we can open the door and go out into the snow, it's right up from the control room into the snow, it didn't sound like snow. So cornstarch is what did it. And, uh, Oh, I was going to say, when, when the sound man is in here, he had a, a thong or a piece of leather on his hand. And, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. For fight scenes, he would, he would hit that thing and it would sound, and you would hear that it sounded real, you know, when he hit it, hitting that leather. And the other thing, as you saw in the, in the acting uh, film, John Todd and the rest of them were bouncing up and down, you know, as they're doing it. Yeah. Because you can't stand around and say, hey, we're running after these guys. No, so they, if, you're do, if you're running, you've got to run. If you're jumping up onto your horse. As a matter of fact, in the script, the word effort would be in there. Sometimes to you get up onto your horse or down, or fighting, or things like that. And, uh, well, thanks, Chuck. Thanks for being here. If you have any other questions, you can meet us outside the hall. <laughs> any pressing question that you just have to know. Thank you.